This is Charter Local Edition. My name is Brad Palmer. It's in the Inland Empire. Today we are joined by Dr. Chad Hansen. He is a research ecologist with the John Muir Project. He is the author of this book for nerds like myself, The Ecological Importance of Mixed Severity Fires, Nature's Phoenix. There is no doubt, sir, that we are dealing with fires, the magnitude of which we have not seen in a long time or not. Well, it's a good question. You know, basically when you get larger fires and more intense fires, uh, it's when you get hot, dry, windy conditions. Fires are, are governed mostly by weather. And uh, certainly we have that uh, in 2015, and we've had that last year as well. Right. And uh, you know, that's when you get your bigger fires. But um, we've had lots of fires that are this size or bigger the one uh, compared to the sure. ones we've had this year uh, in past years and even a long time ago. In fact, some of the biggest fires we've ever had were in the 1800s or earlier. So let's talk about fire and fire suppression because it seems as if the 1800s there were a lot of fires and now in this century there are a lot of fires. In the last century, not as many and I'm going somewhere and it seems as if there was this whole Smokey the Bear campaign that convinced us do everything you can to put out a fire, don't let fires burn, it's the worst thing that could ever happen to any topography or ecology or whatever it is, but now we've learned maybe not. Yeah, and that's, that's really it. We, um the thinking in society in the early 20th century was that fire is categorically bad. It's always right. bad. It destroys forests. It destroys any habitat. We thought of fires the same way we think about uh, uh, fires in a forest, the same way we think about fires burning a home. I see. Fire burns a home, it destroys it. So we think, well, fire burns in a forest, it right. must destroy it too. Right. And uh, it turns out that uh, scientifically, ecologically, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, some of the very best wildlife habitat that we have in our forests and some of the best um, and most biodiverse uh, habitat we have is in post-fire forests. Fascinating. I'm, I'm fascinated and I need to understand why. It seems right. counterintuitive. It is. You would think that when there's a fire, all life is wiped out. It will right. take years to come back, if ever. And, Wrong. Yeah, and, and what's interesting too is that um, a lot of the focus on fires, especially in forests, is right after, while the fire is, fire is burning, mm -hmm. or right after it's out. And in the areas where it burns more intensely, what we call high intensity fire patches, mm -hmm. where the fire kills most or all the trees, which is actually a minority of the way mm -hmm. fire burns. Mostly mm -hmm. it's low and moderate. But in those areas where it burns hotter, um, you know, there's this bed of ash on the ground and right. these charred trees, and people think, wow, that, that looks really bleak. And uh, they think it's gonna stay that way. But in reality, what happens is by the first spring after the fire, and oftentimes even just weeks after the fire, you get these oaks uh, germinating, you get the aspens, Why? and you get all these birds and small mammals that come to it, mostly because of food and homes. Why? Um, because uh, there are these native beetles that are attracted to fire-killed trees. That's what they need to survive. Uh, they're native. They evolved in these forests, okay. and they will fly uh, dozens of miles to find the new fire area. They actually okay. can detect the fire by heat or smoke. They okay. have these receptors in their sure. bodies. And the woodpeckers eat those beetles. They eat the larvae of those beetles under the bark of the fire-killed trees. Okay. The woodpeckers create nest cavities in the fire-killed trees, and they create a new one every year. And that then is used by bluebirds and nuthatches and squirrels, all these species in the forest that need cavities but can't create their own. So without the dead trees, you don't have the beetles. Without the beetles, you don't have the woodpeckers. Without the woodpeckers, no squirrels, no it's bluebirds, It's a cycle of life, literally. Exactly. It's the food chain. Yeah. Yet there are some that believe that what should be done after a fire is to clear. And their view is if you clear the area, that will benefit the ecology because then everything will be clean and pristine. What's the, what do scientists say about that question? Yeah, and that's, that's really important because most of what we know about the ecological importance of these post-fire habitats, uh, what we call snag forest habitat, yes. that's the, the term we use for it, um, has been discovered in the last 10 or 15 years. And so what's being applied on the ground still is really kind of 19th century and 20th century forestry, and it's still being imposed on a 21st century world, even though scientifically we know better. Scientists are overwhelmingly opposed to post-fire logging, because what we realize now is that these post-fire habitats, especially the snag forest habitat that comes from the areas that burn more intensely, right. is actually the very best and the rarest wildlife habitat that we have in these forests in the West. And in fact, there are many wildlife species like the black-backed woodpecker, for example, that are uh, heavily dependent upon that habitat. So if you clear cut those areas, it destroys that habitat for the black-backed woodpeckers, for all these shrub nesting species, and a lot of them have become very rare and are declining and are endangered. What does it do to the soil 
when you clear the area from the post-fire damage? Oh, it's devastating. A study after study shows that uh, post-fire soils are very, very sensitive uh, right after a fire and for, for a number of years. And when the logging equipment rolls in, this heavy, heavy logging machine rolls over and over that forest, when they clear cut these areas, it compacts that soil and it really damages it. It causes a lot of chronic erosion and sedimentation. And uh, not only that, but uh, it rolls over and kills all of the naturally regenerating conifer seedlings, all these pine and fir seedlings that are growing naturally after fire, which they do even in the hottest burn areas. Uh, it kills almost all of that and then it makes it very difficult for the forest to regenerate. Then taxpayers end up spending a million dollars for every thousand acres to artificially replant those areas. But if it's not logged, you don't need to do that. The forest regrows all by itself. What about combustibility? Is the forest that is cleared more combustible or less combustible than if you had just left it as is? Right, it tends to be more combustible, interestingly. And the argument that's often used by the logging industry and also by the US Forest Service, which conducts a lot of mm -hmm. commercial logging projects on federal public lands, people don't realize that often, but the Forest Service sells public timber to private logging companies. So a lot of this clear cutting after fires happens on our public lands. Um, that, the argument that's used oftentimes is that, well, if we remove the trees, that's removing fuel, and therefore it'll reduce right. fire intensity. But anyone who's ever built a campfire knows that that's not true. You don't put a big log on a campfire and light a match to it and expect it to burn. What governs fire is small diameter stuff, kindling, twigs and mm -hmm. needles, and things like that. It's the same in a forest. And so basically the only thing that the logging companies are removing is the material that's basically inflammable, uh, the large tree trunks. And everything that's left behind is mm -hmm. the branches and the treetops and all the combustible material, what we call slash debris. And, uh, and then they plant uh, what they call tree plantations, basically crops after um, the, the fire and after they do the logging. And they pack, pack them really tightly because they want to grow as much timber as possible to cut it again in the future. And those areas, when they burn, they tend to burn much, much hotter. And so actually, again, it's counterintuitive, but it's right. true. Study after study has shown that uh, the areas that uh, are left alone and left to natural processes actually burn less intensely than areas that are logged. We know earlier this year there were some very intense fires in our state. Uh, the Rocky Fire, the Valley Fire, the Butte Fire, causing loss of life. What should be done in those situations where there is a fire burning hot, there, is, there are homes in the midst? It's a complicated scenario. You know, this is one of the most important questions and one of the most important issues that we have to address because still to this day, most of the fire suppression activities and most of the forest management activities are happening rem in remote forest areas, a long ways from the nearest town. Right. And that doesn't do anything to protect homes. We really need to focus our fire suppression and all activities on the homes. And uh, so that when fires burn, uh, we don't have most of, the, of the, the effort and most of the resources over the ridge somewhere in these remote areas. We need to focus it entirely on homes. And the reason that it's been being done that way still is that we have this misguided notion that fire is destroying the forest and therefore it, it uh, is justified to spend a lot of the resources, even most of the resources, instead of protecting communities trying to but, stop but fire in the wildlands. Should we be looking at where people are building homes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, zoning is an important question as well. Uh, where people are building homes, you know, we have restrictions on people building in floodplains. It shouldn't be any different when we're talking mm -hmm. about building in particularly fire prone areas. Um, but as well, we need to have a conversation about helping homeowners fireproof their homes. You know, when so much of the focus is out there in these remote areas where it's not protecting homes, people have this false sense of security. My home is protected because there was that thinning project over the ridge. He it is work that way. Chad Hansen with the John Muir Project, also the author of this book, The Importance, The Ecological Importance of Mixed Severity Fires in Nature's Phoenix. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's Charter Local Edition.